my talk. I appreciate all of you guys taking the time to come down. My name is Ben. I work at Neo. So today I want to talk about Elixir, a new programming language I have been messing around for about close to a year or so. I love it so much that I thought that it would be worthwhile for me to spend one week ignoring my wife to come over here and prepare this presentation. And also to spread some Elixir love. So these are the five things that I want to talk about today. <laughs> the first, I want to give you an idea of what kind of programming language Elixir is. It is a functional programming language. This means that there are no objects. You can pass functions as arguments and return functions as return values. Data structures are immutable. Each time you perform an operation on a data structure, you return a new copy of it. Elixir is a concurrency-oriented programming language. As you will see later, the main concurrency primitive in Elixir is the process. Elixir runs on the Erlang virtual machine. This gives Elixir programmers complete access to the Erlang ecosystem. This means that your Elixir program can use any Erlang library. So let's talk about Erlang a little. Erlang is also a functional programming language. It excels in building distributed systems. And more importantly, it is also famous for its fault tolerance. This means that when an error occurs within your system, the system will still continue to operate normally. These are a few relatively small and obscure companies that are using Erlang. <laughs> You might be able to recognize some of them. <laughs> so here comes the part where I try to convince you why Elixir is worth your time. Let's first talk about the tooling. The first tool I'm going to show you is Interactive Elixir or IEX for short. This is a repo or read eval print loop that you would spend most of your time when you're developing Elixir programs. This demo shows you how Elixir looks like, or rather how IEX looks like, and also shows you the built-in documentation system. So you can see over here, like this, this is just syntax highlighted, markdown formatted documentation that I can access via IEX. The second tool I want to show you is Mix. Mix is inspired by Linigan. So and if you are a Clojure programmer, you'd be probably familiar with that. In fact, one of the core contributors to Mix is also a core contributor to Linigan and one of its original authors. Mix allows you to create an Elixir project quickly and has tasks to handle things like running of unit tests and handling of your dependencies. We are now going to see some Elixir code. I want to show you two of my favorite language features. The first is the pipe operator. What you see here is a valid Elixir code. Stare at it for a couple of seconds and try to figure out what it's trying to do. What this code does is it takes a range from 1 to 10, square each element, and then select elements that are bigger than 10. All right? I think this code is terrible. <laughs> Notice how, in order to understand this piece of code, you must somehow locate the first argument in the innermost function and then work your way outwards. That is way too much work. With pipes, we can express the previous computation in a much, much prettier way. In fact, you can view computation as a data transformation. The use of pipes in this case is somehow similar to the way we use pipes when we're expressing, uh, when we're working with the shell in Unix. Here, we transform the value, or rather the range from 1 to 10, into a list of squared values, then pipe it through into the, and then we pipe it through into the map function. 
square the values, and then pipe it through again into the filter function. All of this is neatly expressed using pipes. But turns out, there's an even shorter way of expressing the previous computation using the function capture operator in Elixir. The outermost ampersand expands into the anonymous function, while the ampersand 1 represents the first argument in the function. My second favorite feature in Elixir is pattern matching. Pattern matching is not new. Languages such as Scala and Haskell has this feature a long, long time ago. The difference is the elegance in which Elixir and Erlang performs pattern matching, especially when it comes to binaries. What we have here is an ID3 tag parser in its full glory. In case you're not familiar with MP3 metadata, the ID3 tag is where the song metadata is stored in. The pattern matching part of the program is highlighted in the box, as you see here. Let's take a closer look at that. So first, we have to calculate the audio part of the MP3, represented by the green portion. We do this by subtracting 128 bytes from the number of bytes of the entire MP3 binary. That's because the ID3 tag is always, always 128 bytes. Since we know the size of the audio portion, we can take this information and destructure the MP3 binary. The binary to be destructured is on the right hand side. The pattern to be defined is on the left hand side. Here, we are saying that the song binary, that is the audio portion, is the size we just computed. The remaining bytes, that is the ID3 tag, is stored in the ID3 tag variable. Once we have the ID3 tag variable, we can further pattern match on it. Again, the thing we want to pattern match is on the right hand side. Look at how the extra how look at how we extract the relevant metadata from the ID3 tag. Compare the size of the bytes to the table above, and you will realize that the byte values exactly match up. That is the power of pattern matching. It allows you to de declaratively say what you want to do in a very elegant way. Pipe operators, pattern matching, they're all well and good. But Elixir has much more to offer. Allow me to introduce you the Ackerman function, my favorite Hello World example. This is the Ackerman function. This function takes in two arguments, M and N, both of which must be zero or more. The first two cases are pretty straightforward. But take a moment to look at the third case. Look at the third case. When m and n are both larger, larger than zero, the second argument calls itself. This means that the value of the Ackermann function grows extremely rapidly, even for very small inputs. For example, if I were to put in Ackermann 43, it results in a ridiculously huge number. Therefore, this makes for a very fun example. This is the same function expressed in Elixir. It should be pretty straightforward to, un to understand. An Elixir program is organized in modules, and within the modules are essentially function clauses. Having introduced the Ackerman function, now let's go on to the fun stuff. We'll see how to write a concurrent program in Elixir using the Ackerman function as an example. Processors, again, are the basic concurrency primitive in Elixir. Processors in Elixir are not operating system processors. These processors are controlled entirely by the Erlang virtual machine. This is a process. And that is a process ID, which is a reference to a process. If I'm lazy, you'll hear me talk about process IDs as PITs. <laughs> 
A process communicates by sending messages and receiving messages. If I know the process ID of any process, I can send it a message. Messages are sent asynchronously, much like in a fire and forget manner. This means that once a process sends over a message, it returns immediately and continues on with the next computation. We will now take a look at our Ackerman example again, but this time we will use processors. The reason we want to do this is to have concurrency. That is, we can fire off multiple computations at the same time and run that in the background. This is most of the code that we need to convert our Ackerman function to, use to be process friendly. The top part we have seen before. This is just the same definition of the Ackerman function. The loop function, that's new. This loop function, when executed in a process, enables the process to receive and respond to messages. Let's see how we can do that. To create a process, we first have to use the spawn function. The spawn function takes in three arguments, the module name, the function name, and a list of arguments. But since our loop function takes in no arguments, we can pass it an empty list. The return value of the spawn function is a pit, again, process ID. Now our process is ready to receive messages. <coughs> Let's send the process w1 a message. The set function takes in the process ID as the first argument and the message as the second argument. The send message is then pattern matched in the receive block. When the pattern matches, the body is executed. And then we get our result. Finally, the loop recursively calls itself so that it can handle the next message. Without the loop, the process dies and therefore will get garbage collected by the virtual machine. When the process receives anything other than a two element tuple, the second catch all pattern is hit and then again we will return the result. Similar to the Similar to the previous example, the body is matched and then the result is printed. Here, I want to show you how we can run functions directly. That is, we are not using any functions for now. For simple computations, we receive the values immediately. But now, let's try something harder. And then, we realize that our process is being blocked for 60 seconds. We cannot do anything about it. Things get a little more fun now. We'll create a process with spawn. We send the process the exact same message as before. Since we're running in a process, it will not block the caller. That is, the IEX session will not be blocked. Notice in this case, we return immediately, but after 60 seconds, we get back the result. But all this while, the caller is not blocked at all. So here, when we send a message other than a two element tuple, we fall back to the second pattern which matches anything. We are going to take things up a notch. We are going to start four processors and give each of them a computationally intensive job to handle. So 
see how the activity monitor lights up completely. The Erlang scheduler knows that, hey, I have four cores in my computer. It is going to put each in each of these processors, it will assign one process to each of these cores automatically. We can go ahead and set, run another process and give it a job to handle. And on the other hand, if we send messages to a busy process, what is going to happen is process, the process is going to be buffered. Or rather, the messages are going to be buffered. Let's talk a bit about fault tolerance. One of the fault tolerance of Elixir comes in the form of supervisors. A supervisor is another kind of process. Its only job is to monitor child processes. Supervisors can also be supervised. This means that we can build supervision trees and layer them to form an even bigger supervision tree. When a child dies, the supervisor can react in a number of ways. For example, it can simply restart the failed child. So here is another way that the supervisor can react. Let's assume the same child died. The supervisor can then terminate all the child processes under the tree and then restart them with new child processes. I'm now going to show you a demo on how you I'm going to show you a demo where you can see how a supervisor restarts a killed child process. Over here, the red balls are unnamed processors, blue balls are named processors, and the green stuff you can basically ignore. So here I'm going to start 50 child processors on one of the supervisors. I'm going to zoom into it. And here I'm going to kill all of the children. But look what happened. The supervisor immediately restarted every single child. So here I create more workers. This time I have 100. Now 200. <coughs> and now I'm going to kill everyone again. 200 workers just spawn just like that. Everything is automatically handled by the supervisor. <laughs> Erlang and Elixir programmers have a let it crash mantra. This means that we do not spend too much time doing defensive programming because our code is going to have bugs, someone is going to trip over the network wire and shit in general is going to happen. <laughs> Instead, what we do is we build supervisor hierarchies to make sure that if something breaks, if something goes wrong, another process can take over and automatically restore the system back into a good state. Let's talk a bit about distribution. The Erlang virtual machine makes it relatively easy to build a cluster of nodes. Processors in a cluster are location transparent. This means that message passing between processors on the same computer is just as easy as between processors on a different node. As long, again, as long as you know the process ID. This is going to be the last example of my talk. We are going to build a distributed system that solves the hardest problem in computer science. That is, to test whether a prime number, or rather a number, is prime or not. But before that, let's spend a moment and talk about how these processes are going to talk to each other. The worker process first requests for a number from the server process, which is represented in the red ball. Note that the worker process also sends over its process ID as part of its message payload. That is because this, this is to enable the server, when he receives the message, he knows, hey, I know which worker 
send me a message, I can reply to that process ID. The server process responds with a candidate number. Hey, worker process 0.81.0. Here's 9067. Please check if this number is prime. When the worker receives the number, it goes on and, and checks for primarity. <coughs> but once done, it sends the server back the result in a tuple. Hey server, yep, 9067 is prime. Finally, it requests for another number to test, and then the cycle just repeats. Since we are using processes here, we can have more than one worker process communicating with the server process to achieve concurrency. But this is nothing new. We have seen this in the Ackerman example. Now, let's introduce nodes. A node is an instance of an Erlang virtual machine. When you start up an instance of IEX, you are already running on a single node. Here, we have a cluster of six nodes. One node in red containing the server process and five other nodes containing three worker processes each. Each of these nodes can communicate and see each other. But for our purposes, the only communication happens between worker processes and the server process. How do the workers know who the server process is? Server has a globally registered name. This means that every process can reference that server process simply by referencing its name and its name is known throughout the cluster. This back and forth message passing happens between multiple processors spanning multiple nodes. Let's see this in action. So in this example, I'm going to set up a three node cluster. As long as you know the name and the IP address, setting up a cluster is a pretty trivial affair. And basically with that, I'm done. I have a three node cluster just like that. Next, I'm going to run the server on the top left hand node, which is represented in the red ball. And I'm going to run a bunch of worker processes on the remaining nodes. So here I start the server. And now that worker is just asking the server, hey, give me a number. I'm going to check it whether it's prime or not. We start another server and then now here it cooperates in finding out numbers. All the server is doing is just dishing out numbers to test for prime. So I stop one of the nodes, but again the server chucks along. Nothing is, nothing is breaking. I can now join back the cluster. and it's business as usual. Finally, I'm going to connect a Raspberry Pi to the cluster. It also then takes, into, takes part into the discovery of prime numbers. Look at how fast it's going. Yeah. 
hummingbird, right? <laughs> Once again, this is what I meant by processes being location transparent. As long as you know the ID, we can communicate with each other. If you want to know more, there are really a couple of books written about Elixir. But more importantly, I'm also writing a book. And currently, I'm, waiting with, I'm working with a publisher to get it in the hands of readers as soon as possible. This is why I'm loving Elixir. It doesn't have too funky a syntax, and as a, primarily a Ruby programmer, it appeals to my aesthetic sense, whether misplaced or not. I love that it's a concurrency-oriented language. It allows me to think of problems to solute, or rather we think of solutions to problems in a very new way. But more importantly, it, Elixir has made concurrency to me more approachable. Fault tolerance and distribution came to me as completely new concepts. Once you see its power, you'll be hooked. Finally, it's wonderful to see that a community that is genuinely interested in helping one another build awesome things. I need to thank two ladies. One is Heather Miller, of which whose slight designs I copied shamelessly. <laughs> The other is my wife, who is in the audience, who allowed me to ignore her for a week or two just to prepare this presentation. <laughs> so once again, thank you for coming to my talk. I hope you will rush out now and install Elixir and try it for yourself. Please come talk to me if you are interested about Elixir, if you have any questions, or if you are just feeling bored. Thank you very much. Hello. Ah, okay. Anyone got any questions for Ben about Elixir and the coolest set of things? Cool, I have a question for you. Okay. Go for it. If I were to learn Elixir, mm -hmm. what is the best way to go about it? Like, think of me as a complete noob with anything to do with everything. So before my book comes out, <laughs> shameless plug for uh, We have a lot of shameless plugs going on today. <laughs> yep. Neo is hiring. Yes, we already heard. <laughs> um, this book is pretty good. Uh, yeah, uh, I see a pretty yeah. triceratops. How is it a cow though? Yeah, it's, cool. it's pretty cute. This is pretty good. Um, it's geared towards um, programmers who are new to functional programming. Okay. And it's pretty... Uh, the pace is pretty decent. So it takes things really slowly, and it doesn't assume that you have any um, Erlang or previous uh, uh, Erlang knowledge. Okay. But at least you have a decent familiarity with programming languages in general, whether Ruby, Java, or whatever. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if like I don't have any Erlang knowledge, mm -hmm. Ruby, or Java, mm -hmm. or anything at all, would you suggest I try Elixir? Or, or I would say like just give it a try. Give yourself two weeks. Uh, mm -hmm. Play with, play around with it. Okay. Uh, if you are stuck. Go on IRC, the people are pretty decent. Obviously. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Questions? Uh, so, is the like less like an actor in systems? Correct. And uh, machines are the most ones. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the, the most ones today, right? So, it's possible that the media distributed system, you try to send a message to the another machine, and say it just crashes. Uh -huh. You might lose the message. So, uh, you have a example like. So for uh, let me let, let me rephrase that question. So probably you're asking about at most once delivery. At, at least once delivery. So let's say um, you try to send a, to this uh, process and it dies, but then you you don't want to like code it yourself like a retry. So I think like um, is that like a mechanism that allows you to uh, have that message delivered transparently? Uh, Right, so I think your question basically hinges on how does Elixir deal with process like sending failures. If I send a message, the process is not there, what happens? Um, my answer to that is the OTP framework, which if you're an Erlang programmer, you'll be super uh, familiar with it. The OTP framework is a bunch of, it's a framework, a bunch of libraries 
which define behaviors. So there's a supervisor behavior, there's a server behavior, and a bunch of other things. Um, think of it as many of these problems are already abstracted away. They're all handled for you. But again, like special cases, you'll have to program it yourself. I don't think there's any silver bullet for that. Thanks for your question. Any other questions for Ben? Go for it. So, one of the languages in most of us is that the whole tolerance act. And I think uh, it's a concept that we don't feel it because we don't uh, use it for or uh, we haven't uh, applied it to uh, some cases. I think it's, uh, it's very easy to share. And we agree on the whole tolerance thing. So, we can uh, see which problems. So if I get your question right, you're saying that things like you're finding hard to think of applications to use, hey, I, why would I need fault tolerance or why would I need supervision? Did I get your question right? And yeah, that's, that's interesting because my work is mostly web applications. And I don't want to do web applications throughout my career. Or that's not the only thing I want to do. There are so many interesting things that I do not know about. And really, it's because of me wanting to learn concurrency and well, distributed systems in general, which is why I stumbled upon Erlang at first and thought, oh my god, like this syntax is way too funky. Then, hey, there's Elixir, let's try this out. And I said, okay, like the syntax clicked and I really like it. As to finding things to I'm still trying to convince my employer to, hey, let's use Elixir for a project. <laughs> but if you look around, if you build any kind of server programs which people in general don't expect to go down, then I think Elixir is a very good fit. And there are also things like Internet of Things coming up. And traditional, traditional programming languages such as Ruby will not be able to handle 10,000 connected devices and will not be able to handle failures gracefully. Why would you say that they can handle it? How do you know that Elixir will handle this load? So the question is, how do you know Elixir can handle a large load? Yeah. Okay. I have faith in the Erlang virtual machine. So, excellent question. The Erlang virtual machine was born out of production necessity. Uh, you're Swedish, right? Yeah, I know the story. I think it's great. I want you to tell it. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Challenge accepted. <laughs> so, the story goes. Do I have time? Yeah, you have plenty. Awesome. Ten minutes. So, long time ago, in 1986, I think, <laughs> Ericsson had a problem. They wanted hardware, they wanted to be able to program hardware for telephone switches. So telephone switches are these things where you make a call, through, through, it does other connection to, to the other side. So who here has experienced your landline crashing? Anybody? No, right? That kind of thing doesn't happen. And that, in 1986, was the problem that confronted Ericsson. How to make sure that your landlines do not disconnect, you don't drop a call midway. And not only that, how do you handle geographical distances? What happens when one of your call centers, there's a fault, somebody trips over a wire, there's a power failure, what happens? So, these brilliant people at Ericsson, these four guys, came about, invented a lang found a nice way to program these telephone switches. Zoom into current, the present day. What they realized is the exact problems they had in long time ago, trying to contact distributed machines, handling failures, maps almost one-to-one -one as the internet we have today. The internet is distributed. If one of our pipe goes down, it shouldn't affect the rest of the world. Does that answer the question? 
Awesome. Perfect. Are there any more questions for Ben? Okay. If not, well, thank you so much, Ben. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.